Hey United, thanks so much for joining us today online. We're so glad that you could make it. And so um, I'm on here today with my friend Lisa because we have some United Four opportunities that are coming up that we would love for you to jump into. And Lisa's gonna help share um, one of those opportunities with all of us. But before I have her do that, I just wanna remind everybody that the blood drive is coming up this Tuesday from two to 7.30. We have lots of slots open to donate blood and we would love for you to help us do that so if you are free um, you can check in online and just write blood drive on there and we'll get you all of the information and so um, yeah mark that on your calendar if you are free but we also have another great opportunity coming up so Lisa can you help share about that and tell us what we are doing and what you're doing <laughs> <laughs> thanks Leah Casey Cares is an organization that's been around for about 20 years. They help critically ill children and their families. They have events where they invite these families to go to. They do a really wonderful thing where they donate pajamas to children that are in the hospital or critically ill at home. Normally they collect anywhere from 19,000 to 20,000 pairs of pajamas a year, but with COVID, they are really in need of pajamas. This year they've only collected about 2,000 pairs. So on the 18th, we're asking everybody if they bring a pair of new pajamas, two pieces, um, to donate and we will make sure that they get to Casey Cares to these families. Perfect. Okay. So I don't know about you guys, but I love a new pair of pajamas. So it's great to be able to just bless these children um, with these pajamas. So make sure on the 18th you uh, come to United and drop those pajamas off. So if you have any questions about either of the opportunities about the blood drive or about um, Casey Cares and the pajama drive, just write on your uh, check-in card online, either one of those, and we will get in contact with you about more of them. But um, right now we're going to head in to week two of our series, Broken Saviors. Hey friends, thanks for joining us again online. It was great to see many of you come out in person last week as we celebrated our birthday. And uh, maybe you're back online again, uh, joining us and we're just be glad to be able to be uh, together in this way. And so thanks for jumping in. Make sure you fill out that online uh, connect card and keep us posted on what's going on in your life. Um, but we're gonna jump back into our series, Broken Saviors. And we're gonna start by talking about a dude who is left-handed. I don't know if you're left-handed, raise your hand, your left hand if you're left-handed. I can't see you, but wave at the screen and uh, maybe you're a lefty. In fact, maybe 10% of the people who are raising their hand as they listen to this message are left-handed because statistically that's what we are told is that 10% of the world's population, their dominant hand is their left hand. Now that's good news for lefties. Uh, so apparently statistics prove, I don't know how they do this, but they prove that lefties have higher levels of intelligence. They have better rhythm. So hopefully they're drummers. Uh, they have uh, more creativity uh, than others. I don't know how that is measured, um, but also left-handed people are better daydreamers. Now, I don't know if that's a compliment, like a good thing or not, like daydreaming uh, in many cases is not necessarily a good thing, uh, but being left-handed is certainly an advantage in many ways, certainly in sports. It's an advantage if you're a tennis player, a basketball player, a baseball player, or if you're a boxer, and what, Famous boxer, do you know that's left-handed? My famous box, my favorite boxer, I should say, is Rocky Balboa. Now I know he's a fictional character. He's not really a actual boxer, but if you remember, if you ever watched the Rocky series, he's a Southpaw. Why? Why? Because he's left-handed. And, you know, lefties are celebrated in our culture today. In fact, there is an international left-handed day. 
and maybe you didn't know this, so if you have a loved one, whether it's a friend or a family member who's left-handed, make sure you write this date on your calendar, August 13th, or maybe you are left-handed and you want to be celebrated more. On August 13th is your day. Uh, it's International Left-Handed Day. I don't know how that is celebrated, but make a note of that and add that um, to another day where you can get gifts. So in addition to Christmas and your birthday, maybe International Left-Handed Day on August 13th is your day to celebrate you. But there's also disadvantages to being left-handed. For instance, zippers. So righties don't get this, don't understand this, but years ago I had a jacket. For some reason, the zipper came up on the left side and it was a pain in the rear end to be able to try to zip up that zipper. Um, and so I understood what it was like to be a lefty who always has to use a right-handed zipper. Or how about scissors? So have you ever tried to cut something with your left hand? Maybe your right hand has been injured for some reason and you only have your left hand to use and it's nearly impossible to use scissors with your left hand. And history also has some disadvantages um, for those who are lefties. For instance, just the word lefty in other culture is not good. You know, the Latin word for left is sinister, which means evil. Uh, the French word is goash, which means awkward. And even the English word left comes from the old English word that means weak. And so weakness is what is associated and historically has been associated with some lefties. And it's particularly associated um, to the lefty that we're going to be digging in, learning about from the Bible this morning. Um, he was a lefty who was one of the first judges of Israel. And if you're wondering, like, what's a judge of Israel? And maybe this is week one for you tuning into this series, Broken Saviors. Uh, we, we were introduced to judges last week. And judges are these guys and one gal um, who was a judge uh, who are not like on TV in a court of law as we think about judges, but they are leaders. They're temporary leaders that God sets in place um, in the nation of Israel in his, this time period before kings were set in place um, to help um, God's people. And they help God's people in a specific way, which we learned last week. Trey introduced us to this vicious cycle that the Israelites, God's chosen people, got themselves into before kings were established um, in the nation of Israel. And it was this cycle where they would run from God and they would disobey. They would turn their backs on God. And as a result of turning their backs on God, they would have experienced consequences for that sin against God and they would be disciplined by God. And then in the midst of their discipline, they would cry out to God asking for some relief for God to be merciful. And then God would send a rescuer. And the rescuer was called a judge. And the judge would often lead through this cycle of restoring Israel back to God. And it was this cycle. It's just those four words. If you think about those four words, run, and then discipline, cry, rescue. The Israelites would run from God. And then the next part of the cycle, they would be disciplined by God. And the third part of the cycle, they'd cry out to God in the midst of the discipline, save us. And then the fourth part of that cycle is then they would be rescued by a judge. And we'll see the pattern. Just open up your Bible right now to Judges 3. And we're going to read through the entire um, chapter this morning. We're going to start actually in verse 5. And we're going to look at one of the first judges uh, in uh, the Bible who we're going to just use this first story real quickly as an example of this cycle. So check it out in verse uh, five of chapter three in the book of Judges. It says, the Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And they took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. Remember the cycle? What's the first part of the cycle? What do we see right there? Run. They ran from God. It's the run from God. They forgot God because they started worshiping other gods of these other nations. And before we get self-righteous, Trey helped us not to be self-righteous last week by saying like, we also run from God. Personally, we turn our backs on God and we get stuck in a vicious cycle of sin. But as my family and I talked about the message last week, we typically will review the message and talk about what we learned. We were talking about what if we didn't talk about the Bible personally and just like how we see ourselves personally in the story. But what if in the same way the story is told about Israel, what if 3,000 years from today, 
people write a story about the church in 2020 and they talk about the corporate church. What are our blind spots? What are maybe the other gods that we turn to that are false gods and turn and forget the one true God? Maybe it's sleeping in Sunday mornings and watching football and forgetting about God. Uh, Maybe it's we're so focused on maintaining our personal freedoms and fighting for our freedoms that we don't speak up for people that don't have freedom, who are oppressed and poor. And maybe the story that's told of the church today, when I say the church, I'm not speaking of a specific church, but of the worldwide church or the American church, maybe there's a way that we're turning our backs on God. And maybe there's a cycle that not just personally, but even corporately, we can identify with. And that's what Israel is is happening with them. They're running from God corporately as a group of people. And then the anger of the Lord is stirred in verse eight. And it says that he sold them into the hands. I'm just gonna read this abbreviated version of Kushan. I can't even say that next word. King of Aram, can't say that next word. To whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. And so again, they're now being disciplined by being subject to a guy who does not follow God and being oppressed by this ruler. But what do they do next? What's the third part of the cycle? They cry out to the Lord. And then what's the fourth part of the cycle? They're rescued. So the verse goes on in verse nine. So he raises up for them a deliverer who is Athenil. And it goes on to talk about how Athenil rescued from them from this tyrannical ruler and they had peace for 40 years. So we see the cycle over and over and over again today, but the judge that we want to focus on, it's one of the first three judges in Judges chapter three um, that we're going to focus on because he has, he steals the show here in chapter three. He's the South Paul savior. He is the lefty um, who comes. He's the one who is weak and viewed as weak and comes to rescue Israel. So let's check it out together as we continue through chapter three in verse 12. So it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Remember the cycle? Run. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Because they did this evil, uh, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israelites. Getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel. They took possession of the city of Palms, and the Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years years. So again, we're just seeing this pattern go again and again where they run from God and they're disciplined here this time, not just for eight years, but for 18 years. And Eglon is a bad dude. Um, He is not a guy you would want to be your president or your leader, the leader of your nation. See, Eglon for 18 years was responsible for the Israelites being raped, being pillaged, and being murdered. He was an evil king. And again, the Israelites, because of this, what we see in verse 15, they cry out. They cry out for mercy, for God to save them. And then right away, it says, he gives them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man. I've always called him Ehud, so I might say Ehud or Ehud. I'm talking about the same guy if I happen to do that. Um, But Ehud is the judge who is now going to lead and rescue Israel. But there's an interesting detail if you didn't see it yet, and I brought attention to it as I introduced the message, is he's left-handed. And it's not just that he's a lefty. Uh, It actually literally means that he could not use his right hand, meaning he was disabled. Uh, We don't know exactly the the severity of the disability that he had, but either his right hand was crushed or withered um, or maybe disabled at birth. We have no idea. Um, But he lived in a world where his disability was looked down on significantly, um, where he was not valued, he was seen as worthless, um, and, and nobody would have ever looked to Ehud um, to be the next judge or leader of anything, let alone pick him up as a kid on their kickball team. You know, he was not valued in his culture in this time because of his disability. And so what we see is God starting to use Ehud, um, who might not be valued in his culture, but he's incredibly brave. And he volunteers to bring a gift to the king and reads on in verse 16, where it says, Ehud made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab, who was a very fat man. 
again, there's some really interesting details. You know, talking about Ehud being a lefty. Now, this king being a fat guy, which we'll come back to in a second. You'll see the significance of that. But he volunteers to deliver a tribute. And that, maybe you're thinking Hunger Games tribute. A tribute here, it's just a gift. He's bringing a big wagon of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, or something like that, to Eglon uh, to give him a gift. Uh, as Israelites want to respect this king and so forth. Uh, yet, he's also secretly packing heat. And nobody would have run Ehud through a metal detector um, or been worried about him because of his disability. Uh, And so he kind of is able to get right into the presence of Eglon. And it goes on to say, after he presented the tribute, he sent on their way to those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone near Giggle, he himself went back to Eglon. So he's starting to leave, but he turns around real quick and he says, your majesty, I've got a secret for you. And for some reason, I don't know why, Eglon was intrigued. I don't know if Eglon was reading HuffPost every day and now he thinks he's the one that's going to see the headline first or what the secret is um, that Ehud has, but he's excited. And so he says, all right, I want to hear it. And he tells all of his servants to leave and they all leave. And so now this unsuspecting guy, um, Ehud, uh, who has a disability, uh, who nobody is scared of, especially Eglon, is one-on-one and has no idea what's coming for him. And it says, Ehud approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace. And he says, I got a message from God for you. And so the king rises up from his seat and Ehud reached with his left hand because his right hand doesn't work. And he draws the sword from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. And even the handle sank in after the blade and his bowels discharged. Ehud did not pull the sword out and the fat closed in over it. I mean, that is gross. If we're honest, if we read this story, if this story were turned into a movie, I bet you a lot of us wouldn't want to watch the movie. Um, It might not be our cup of tea in the type of movie that we would watch. But this is exactly what happens in this moment in great detail uh, that Eglon is so fat that Ehud couldn't even pull the knife out and he takes a dump in the middle of the room, which is important detail, uh, which you'll see in a second. um, Because, and what happens is, is as the story goes on, Ehud went out to the porch. He's sneaking away. He just killed this king, this king that everybody has feared for 18 years. This guy killed him. He's sneaking away. I picture like Jason Bourne sneaking away, but Ehud is certainly not Jason Bourne. Um, But he just killed the most powerful man he knows that he's ever known. And it says in verse 24, after he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. And they said he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. Why are they suspecting that he's relieving himself? Well, we read that detail. He took a dump. They can smell it. It stinks, and they're embarrassed. They don't want to interrupt their king. They don't want to be disrespectful to him. And all of that is providing an opportunity for what? For Ehud to escape. And Ehud's escape is really important because Ehud escapes, and check out why it's important that he escapes. Say they waited to the point of embarrassment and when they did not open the doors of the room, meaning they're, they're knocking on the doors now and they're not hearing anything, they They're trying to open the doors, but they're locked. So they take a key and they unlock it. And there they saw their Lord fall onto the floor, dead. But in the midst of all this time being wasted because they're embarrassed to interrupt their king, check out what's happening. Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Sariah. Then he arrived there. He blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim and the Israelites went down with him from the hills with him leading them. If Ehud wasn't able to escape, he would have never been able to blow that trumpet. The nation of Israel would have never rallied troops to go and to fight against the Moabites. And I love this picture because what happens is Ehud leads a military conquest where 10,000 men's lives, Moabite men are, are killed and Israel is now free from Eglon and the Moabites. And why I love this picture is because just a few hours uh, earlier in this story, Ehud is seen as useless, devalued, and now he is leading God's people to victory and freedom. The weak and despised one becomes the rescuer. 
Does that sound similar to another story that you've ever heard? This is why I love this picture. The weak and despised one becomes the rescuer because it points to Jesus Christ. When we read any part of the Bible, it all points to Jesus. And so as we read this story, it particularly points to Jesus because what happened is it brought peace to the land, 80 years of peace it brought. And when the weak and despised one, Jesus Christ, when he became the rescuer, he brought peace to the world. And all of these stories that we see throughout the Old Testament, particularly this one, points to and is foreshadowing of Jesus coming and being a better savior and being a better deliverer and being a better rescuer. And what it teaches us is this first point, that God's ultimate rescue would come through weakness, not through strength. See, God often rescues people not through a show of force and strength, but through things we don't expect and often through weakness, things that we're expecting something bigger, greater, more significant, and yet God chooses something else that we're not necessarily looking for. I don't know if you've ever heard the story of the guy who was stuck on his roof in the midst of a flood, and he starts praying to God to rescue him, to help him. And pretty soon there's a rowboat that comes, you know, down by his house, and the guy in the rowboat says, jump in. I'm here to help you. And the guy says, I'm praying to God. I have faith that God's going to rescue me. And the guy in the rowboat goes on. And then another boat comes, a little more important. It's a motor boat. It's got a motor. It's a little more expensive, a little nicer, shinier, and so forth. And the guy in there is like, hey, I'm here to rescue you. I'm here to help you. And the guy on his roof is, who's been praying to God says, don't worry. I've been praying to God. I've got faith in him. He's going to take care of me. And so the guy driving this motor boat is confused and drives away. And then this helicopter comes and it's flying over top of this man and on, on his roof as the flood continues to rise and he drops a rope and he says, pull, grab a hold of the rope, I'll pull you up. And the guy screams up to the guy in the helicopter saying, don't worry, I've been praying to God, I got this. God's going to take care of me. And the helicopter pilot reluctantly flies away and soon enough, the, the flood overtakes the house. The man drowns. He finds himself next to God in heaven complaining, God, why didn't you save me? And God says, I sent you a, a rowboat, a motorboat, and a helicopter, and you never jumped on any of them. You see, that man was expecting something better, something more miraculous, something more significant, and yet God will often surprise us in unexpected ways. And one of those unexpected ways throughout the story of the Bible is through weakness. It's through ways that we're not looking for. Nobody was expecting Ehud to be the next judge to give 80 years of peace to the Israelites. And in the same way, nobody was expecting Jesus of Nazareth to be a despised and rejected king coming as Israel's rescuer. Nobody saw it coming. People were just like that guy on his rooftop looking for a better savior, looking for a man who had a house, looking for a man who won a war, looking for a man who was a great politician, a smooth talker. And when the Jews thought about salvation, they were looking for the mighty warrior king who was going to end oppression. When the Greeks were looking for a king, they were looking for the eloquent, enlightened philosopher of the world. And nobody expected a savior who was poor, who didn't own a home, who never won a war and, and would in fact be executed as a criminal. In the same way that nobody saw Ehud coming, Eglon didn't see it coming, uh, nobody saw Jesus coming too. See, Jesus had a dagger of his own. If you think of Ehud's dagger that he pulled out to take the life of Eglon, Jesus had a dagger too. People didn't know that because they, he was executed. They thought he was done, his life was over. But his dagger was the dagger of the resurrection. So when people thought they killed him through death, he took his dagger and he stabbed death with his dagger. And that's called the resurrection because Jesus overcame death. He defeated death. Death has no more sting because Jesus was raised to fullness and newness of life so that we could also be raised to newness of life. So Jesus' work wasn't completely finished on the cross. It was finished through his resurrection and ascension into heaven. And that was the dagger and the unexpected uh, thing that Jesus had that he offers to people. And our main problem in this life 
And when we pray prayers about make my life better or take away my suffering or change this in my life, we'll often want God to do this, that, and the other thing in our lives. And, and yet God's answer to us might be unexpected. His main answer to us is the thing that you need most in your life is a savior, is Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of your sins, to be no longer separated from God, but reconciled to God and in right relationship with God. And unfortunately, many people in our world will shrug their shoulders saying, I'm fine. I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. And they look just like that man on that rooftop, not wanting to jump in the boat. I've got things figured out on my own. I've got my own way, thinking that there's a better way than the way that God would have for them. And many of us try to pull ourselves up by our own strength, by saying, I believe in Jesus, but I'm also gonna you know, try hard. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work hard in this life and pull my act together. And the weakness that Ehud has in his life points to not just the weakness of Jesus and how Jesus would save through in an unexpected way, but the weakness of the message of the gospel that is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God who are, of those who are looking to Jesus Christ. Why? Because this message is summarized in the Bible saying this, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And it's not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that nobody can boast. So what this verse teaches us is what is unexpected sometimes is not just the way that God would rescue us from our sin and would rescue us and restore us into a relationship with God, but what we need to do. Because oftentimes too many people think we need to do something. I need to be a good person. I need to follow the rules. I need to pay back the debt, um, that I, the wrongs that I have done I need to make right. Uh, yes, I believe in Jesus, but I also need to. And it's a formula of Jesus plus something else, living a life this way, and then I'll be right with God. And yet the foolishness and the weakness of the message is that it's a gift that we receive. That the the weakness of the gospel message that the world sees as weak is that we don't do anything. I need to do something. I need to bring a gift to God, right? I need to do something for him. And, And the gospel message is no, Jesus has done it all. Jesus lived a perfect life because you can't live a perfect life. He died a death on the cross to pay the consequences of sin that we can never pay back and he raised and defeated death and those are all things we can't do. And so grace is the fact that God is giving us freely a gift to be received by God and in faith, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, that is the simple way to be right with God. It doesn't mean we have to do anything except for place our faith in in that message. See, God saves us through the weakness of receiving a gift, not the strength of being good enough. And that is why the gospel of Jesus Christ is often called the good news of Jesus Christ. Because if it was up to us, we'd fall short. We'd fail. We would never be good enough. Not a single one of us. Because the question is then, how good is good enough? And how good good enough is, is perfection. And Jesus is the only one who has been perfect. Jesus is the only one who can stand in our place as a substitute for our sin. Jesus is the only one that can offer us true salvation. And the story of Ehud points forward to a method and a message that is built in weakness, that is completely unexpected, And even as I talk about it now, there are times that I think, how does this message change people's lives? I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to my natural thinking. And yet, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ in this way, it does change our life. It transforms our life. The Bible says that we are made a new creation in Jesus Christ. The old is gone, new has come, and we have fullness of life, the Spirit of God living in us through this simple message. Just because It's simple, don't write it off. It's the good news of Jesus Christ offered to everybody freely. And Ehud teaches us another lesson. That's the most important lesson, but there's another important lesson for us to walk away with this morning because we've got to remember who Ehud was. He wasn't a natural leader, you know. He had the cards stacked against him in life when it became his senior year and everybody's picking who's the most successful person or who's the person that is predicted to kill King Eglon. It wasn't Ehud. Um, He was the last person that would have come to people's mind. And he also knew, though, that even though he was the last pick, 
even though that he was the unexpected judge or leader, Ehud knew the God that he served. And he had faith that if God had called him to do this, to take Eglon's life, to be the next leader, that he would faithfully do whatever God told him to do. And what Eglon teaches us, which is really important, is God is more focused on your availability than your ability. God's more focused on, are you making yourself available to him? Or are you focused on needing to be good enough, needing to be gifted enough, needing to be smart enough, needing to have your act together? See, if you're waiting to get your life together or to receive some special power from God to serve him, I have good news for you this morning. You can stop waiting. If, if you don't think you're gifted enough or have the capacity to make a difference in the kingdom of God, I've got new good news for you. You don't need special gifts and abilities in order to do that. You just need to make yourself available to God. That's simply what Ehud did. He didn't, you don't need special training or to have your marriage and family life all polished up or to have your purpose in life figured out. You can simply ask to make yourself available to God today. And you can ask this one question. It's a simple question. I would encourage you to write it down. Ask God this question in your own time this week. How can you use my life? Talk to God through prayer. You, the real you, having a real conversation with the real God. Say, God, how can you use my life? And when Ehud asked God that question, the answer he got blew his mind. You're going to be the next judge. You're going to rescue God's people. It, it was probably overwhelming. That's huge. How, am I, how can I do that? And God said, sharpen a small dagger. That was step one for Ehud. God might have given you step one. He might have given you the small dagger to sharpen. Maybe you just need to volunteer at church and start getting around some people and serving together with people at a food distribution. We got a blood drive coming up. We have a variety of ways to serve and volunteer at United Church. Um, but, But maybe... Sharpening your dagger looks different than just volunteering in a church. Maybe it's taking a coworker out for lunch that you know you need to tell about Jesus and you just need to be their friend. Go out for lunch with them, ask how you pray for them. And that's the, that's the first step. That's sharpening your dagger for what God wants to do in your life, how he wants to use you to reach other people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to go back to school and finish that degree or that certification program or or maybe you already know. I don't have to start offering suggestions. Maybe you have a vision and a burden that God's called you to do and you're still just overwhelmed by it and you can't just take one step of faith and sharpen your dagger. Whatever step that is, I would encourage you to ask God, what is that next step? Maybe it's a simple question of who do I serve today, right now? Forget about five years from now where you want to be and what you want to be doing. What are you supposed to do right now? Who are you supposed to tell about Jesus today? What are you not doing yet that you're supposed to be doing? What burden do you have that you're still waiting on? One of our partners, uh, our global partners, we call different organizations partners at United. Uh, it's called Belief in Motion, and they're in Romania, based in Romania, and Leah has been our source of connection with this organization. And she's friends with um, Lainey, who is on staff with Belief in Motion. And Lainey was uh, a child of missionaries uh, in Romania. And as she was a child, uh, she would often be involved in the work that her parents were a part of. And she would, part of that work was visiting orphanages uh, often. And she would be there and she had a connection with different children. But there was one girl in particular um, that she shares about uh, connecting with. And this girl was always happy, always kind of carefree. And one day when Lainey showed up, she wasn't anymore. She was sad. She didn't seem to have the same excitement. And Lainey found out that she lost that excitement because in that orphanage that she was a part of, she had been molested. And that experience not only traumatized her, but it stole the life from her. It stole the excitement and energy and vibrancy. And that broke Lainey's heart as a preteen girl wondering, what can I do about this? And she wanted to make sure that that didn't happen to other girls. She had a huge vision, but she's a preteen girl. What's the step that she's supposed to take? She picked up a guitar. She started writing songs. Before she knows it, she's traveling around different churches in America, raising funds for her parents' organization that now is her organization that she's a part of and represents. And today, 
Lainey has helped build three homes for girls to be safe and protected, to be cared for, to be fed. And she now oversees that part of the ministry for Belief in Motion. United has, been, has made a huge contribution um, to that ministry. And it all started um, with somebody you wouldn't expect, a 12-year-old girl who would bring rescue and restoration and hope um, to many young Romanian children. What is the availability that God is asking you to do? What, how do you need to make yourself available? It's as simple as figuring out the answer to that question because God works through ordinary people and ordinary ways to do extraordinary things that can change and transform people's lives. If only we would ask him what are we supposed to do and we'd actually do it. We can take what we view as weakness in our life. I don't have my life together. I don't really feel like I'm that important or I can make that much of a difference. And we can bring true change to the lives of other people. Ehud's life is an example of submitting to, to God in weakness and letting God work through him. His life not only serves us as an example of that, but it points us to the most important message of Jesus Christ. That Jesus came, man, and he died on the cross for us. And the foolishness of that message is the saving power that is offered to any of us today. And my hope is that you would receive that in faith, place your faith in Jesus Christ, and that you would then walk in obedience to Jesus, seeking to bring restoration to our world, to our community, to your family, to your friends, as a result of faithfully submitting your life to God.